Get the disco mic. Okay. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, welcome to another episode of the Roundup True Crime with Mike. And we are here with the panel again. And we are here after the verdict in the Delphi trials. And if you haven't heard, I think most people probably have at this point that he was found guilty on all four counts that he was charged with. And as I understand them, it was two counts of murder and two counts of really kind of felony murder or which was murder while committing kidnapping. So we'll talk about how that play, how that will play out and kind of the sentencing and how that works in the end. I know, unfortunately, not the three of us aren't really like law experts to know if those will collide or if those will merge for sentencing. I was trying to find that out earlier today and I didn't get a full answer. So let's just talk about, um, I guess what happens and, um, so I guess what was it Thursday after Thursday was the closing arguments. Um, they wrapped up with a couple hours left on mm -hmm. Thursday. So the jury deliberated on Friday until about, well, I think it was maybe 4 p.m. their time. Came back for a couple hours on Saturday and then they came back today and, and it was around three or four hours that they deliberated and then they uh, released their verdict to the court. So, and I heard that sentencing is December 20th. Yep. So I guess I think everybody here is elated with the, with the verdict and believes it the right one. So, um, yeah, I think everybody, like the two sides are, are going to fight forever on this one, but, uh, definitely one, I mean, it's not a competition. So, I mean, two girls right. were killed. So, but yes, there is some justice for the, the, the girls. So, I will open it up and uh, let, uh, I guess, uh, Lydia go first and what you want to add first. Well, the first thing I want to add is I cannot wait until these families finally can take back the narrative from what's been happening on the Internet d during this gag order and during this process leading up to trial and trial. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from these girls families again because i think they've just suffered a lot of unnecessary trauma from you know outside influences and i want to hear them speak on that so my thoughts and prayers obviously go out to these girls families i can't wait for them to take the the narrative back and I trust juries. You guys know we were, you've been in chats. I never had any doubt that this was going to be a guilty verdict, not even a second of doubt. And Richard Allen was the best witness the prosecution had. And anybody who doesn't see it, doesn't understand it, doesn't feel like telling the truth about it is just wrong. He sealed his fate. Actually, he sealed his fate in February of 2017, but he really sealed his fate during this trial. And I love that the jury took their time. They had a ton of evidence to go through. They are probably completely traumatized by what they saw and probably also need a little bit of time to absorb that. But the, the vast majority of the evidence that convicted Richard Allen came from Richard Allen, in my opinion. Okay, Jason, your opening thoughts? Yeah, you know, similar thoughts to you that the best witness in this case against Richard Allen was Richard Allen. Um, whether it was his 60 plus confessions, including some that had, <clears throat> depending on how you see it, information that only the killer had or information that was you know, uh, not widely known, um, then him placing himself on the, the bridge and admitting to have a, having a weapon that gave them probable cause to match it to the bullets. The best witness throughout this case is Richard Allen. And, <clears throat> you know, I was recently having a conversation with somebody who um, believed in his innocence and I said, you know, why will you not believe the man when he's trying to tell you in every way from the beginning to the end? Now, certainly he could have come forward and also been guilty as a forensic countermeasure, but everything about his behavior um, pointed to him 
being the killer and he's the one who pointed us along the way to that answer unlike you lydia i definitely had moments of doubt um i think my doubt was really rooted in the idea that all it takes is one holdout mm -hmm. and in the broader true crime community <clears throat> it's always hard to tell because you know if you look at i i'll caveat this because i don't want to I don't want to put this on the entire community, but certainly among the loudest voices, and I don't mean creators, I just mean the loudest voices and listeners, it's pretty evenly split. So it felt as if the possibility of having one holdout or having one person who had been exposed to some of the theories that were disallowed at trial um, uh, could have, uh, could have, uh, could have really kept this jury from coming back with a guilty verdict. However, I was really heartened um, over the weekend when the jury came in to look at evidence and they wanted to look at two videos, mm -hmm. videos of his interrogation yep. and videos of, or copy of the video that Libby took while she was on the bridge, which suggested to me that they are thoroughly going through the evidence. Mm -hmm as opposed to uh, trying to convince a holdout in one direction or the other. So I was heartened by that piece of it. Um, and and you, I should, you should take 18 hours to deprive someone of their liberty. You should. Oh, I, think it's, I think it's reasonable. And, and what juries do and decide to do, you know, is beyond me. I, you know, I, I, I remember covering one case where the jury made the decision. They did a poll at the beginning. And everyone believed in guilt, everyone. And then they agreed among themselves, now we're going to go through every piece of evidence and just try to disprove ourselves. And so whatever they were doing there, assuming it wasn't playing cards for 18 hours, um, I think uh, this jury clearly, carefully um, considered the evidence just based on the one hour for every day, one hour of deliberations for every day of of trial probably meant they were going back and they were truly trying to either disprove or prove different elements of it. Um, well, yeah. like, Brett, like Brett said, they're, they weren't in it for the views and the clicks and the, you know, super well, chats. And they were completely <laughs> distanced from this case. They didn't know anything about this case. And this is another really interesting observation for me as once the jury started deliberating, the national news media started writing about the case much more. Yeah. And it was really fascinating to see my friends who are not true crime fans, who know very little about Delphi, getting exposed to it. And that group of people, conservative, liberal, didn't matter. Their first walkaway impression was like, oh, they're torturing this poor Richard Allen in solitary confinement. And it just reminded me of... And, and, you know, at first, initial blush, she said that's a bad thing. But it reminded me of something that really panned out today, that the vast majority of people in, in Indiana, in the country, know nothing about this case. Mm -hmm. And they also, assuming they picked the jury well, knew nothing about the conspiracy theories. Yep. Um, and that was even borne out. Uh, I heard about a conversation today with a, a local reporter who covers the case, um, you know, sort of like secondary support coverage to it, who knew nothing about the, the Odinist criminal gang uh, theories. So, you know, it just reminded me, looking at this case very cleanly, it's a pretty simple case. And yep. it really just comes down to, do you believe certain things? And if you believe them, it's fairly simple. And and somebody made this observation. This was not me. S somebody in in the murder sheet group or on Twitter or something made this point, which is even if they're calling it solitary confinement, which it wasn't, but even if all of these things that they said about his pretrial detention were true, it changes none of the facts about what happened on February 13th, 2017. Well, and the bottom, line, bottom line is I have never heard of an instance in all my mental health work and outside of it where psychosis allows you to see in the mind of a killer and see a fact that a killer saw. So right. even like if Brad you, Weber. 
<laughs> right. And even so, even if Richard Allen was psychotic, the problem that you run into, and 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 people have said it's the one instance with the white van, but it is really more more that also aligns with the physical evidence, more that aligns with even the cell phone data about when the phone stopped and when this when it started. There's a lot of evidence that it would have been really hard to know unless Richard Allen was the killer or was secretly rifling through the files of the police department. Right. And and the one question nobody wants to ask on the conspiracy side is why didn't he make the one simple choice he could have made, which is to say, I saw that guy. I saw that guy. I was there that day. And I saw a bridge guy. He well, didn't do that because he didn't see bridge guy because he was bridge guy. But well, he didn't that, even put that together. Like, oh well, yeah, I, I saw that guy in the Carhartt jacket. I saw well, him. I don't think I, I, I at the time he came forward, had the video come out? Yes. Or just the picture? Mm -hmm. Oh, the picture. that I'm not sure. I'd have to look. Well, no, I, but, but he didn't come out and say very much. I mean, maybe I'm confused. I don't think he said very much. Back in he said exactly oh, he what he was wearing. He mentioned seeing what he was wearing. He mentioned yes. seeing the, in the note to that, the, that, the note that was lost. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. That was recovered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he not just he that, saw. he said, I saw two girls that look like sisters. And the two witnesses that said they saw him were sisters. Right. Now, how do you not put that together as the guy that was on the bridge. Yeah. So like Mike, what and Richard Allen, Richard Allen said that he saw the people on the trail who said they saw bridge guy, but you know what Richard he, Allen did not see. He did not see bridge guy, nor did right. he see Abby and Libby. So you right. have to believe to believe in his innocence. You have to believe that Richard Allen at the same time, all these people were on the trail walked out onto the trail, saw the people who saw him, but didn't see Bridge Guy and right. didn't see Abby and Libby. So you have to believe that. And you have to believe that Richard Allen parked in a spot that conveniently hid his car when everybody else was parked in the two main right. parking lots. And you also have to believe that mysteriously, this man who happened to be on the bridge and did not see this bridge guy who must have been an apparition at that point um invisibility cloak that also a bullet that appears to have come from his gun ended up in between the two girls and you also have to believe that this man accidentally did not tell his wife that he was actually on the bridge and simply said that he was on the trail that day and you you also have to believe that he just happened to have bridge as clothes and he he psychotically confessed 60 times and if you can believe all those things go ahead and acquit but i don't know how but also stop doing drugs and yeah, no, 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 no. but i mean look if people can believe those things particularly two of them right you need two of them the first one you need is you need to somehow believe that the confessions are not real Second thing, right. you have to believe that the ballistics are bad on that. You take those two things out, eh, you know, reasonable doubt. It becomes like probably him, but reasonable doubt. But if you can't believe all those things, you might be able to say not guilty, but you certainly cannot say innocent. And what well, about the video of his of him having a conversation with his wife in the police station mm -hmm. when she says, you told me you weren't on the bridge that day. Like Ooh. this lie captured in a conversation between uh, this murderer and his wife where she's like, wait a minute, you lied to me. You told and me you weren't on the bridge that day. And now here in the police station, I find out that you were on the bridge that day. And I can imagine the jury wanting to go back and look at that scene because that's one of the tapes that they decided mm -hmm look at so yeah no i, mean, I guess the only thing, i wasn't arguing with you i was oh i didn't know you were no because i was just trying to understand because like he did come forward in like 2017 
and told the cop, like he called into the tip line and said, in a couple hey, of days. Was, but I don't know what he actually said in 2017. He said, I'm dressed like bridge guy. I was on the bridge. I saw the people that saw me and I went home and all of this, he specified the time window yeah. of the murders. He said, I was there from 1 30 to 3 30, which he later changed. But he's like, okay, I was there. He I said, was there for a couple of hours. Park. Right. Said where he parked, said what time he was there, which lined up with the murders. It also lined up with the footage that they found on the video on right. a nearby road. He said that he saw the witnesses who said they saw Bridge Guy. Mm -hmm. He said he did not see Abby and Libby. He said he gave his uh, IME eye for his phone, which is that internal number. Yeah, talk about the magic bullet. How about which, the magic phone? Which could not be located mm -hmm. there. Of all the 24 then, phones or whatever. Right. right. And then two, and then years later when he's arrested, he's got two stories, right? He's got two competing stories. One, I was on my phone and I was right. looking at stocks. And two, I was looking at fish. And we can have debates about fish. It has clear water or not, but they would be very tiny, no matter how big they are, if you were looking from maybe an eagle would have an easy time seeing them. Actually, an eagle would Yeah, be I, I guess and I was thinking is is but, but, story... but what I'm saying is like just look at that statement alone, yeah. right? And 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 the, the big lies the lie to the wife, it contradicts what he said on that day to, to Dan and, and right. Dylan, the investigator. And he gave him a ton of information that was relevant ultimately to, mm -hmm. to the trial. Now, the one that I can't figure out, and I want to know what you two think of this because it's a puzzle to me is when he was shown the photo of himself on the bridge, he said, if the girls took that photo, it's not me. What does that mean? Just because uh, he didn't see the girls and he wasn't there and blah, 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 all those other lies? Or because well, he obviously I an, knew. I, I, I have an easy answer for you on that one, right? I think the easy answer, the most logical answer is in that moment, he doesn't know where that photo is from. Whether you're holding up a photo that you know is him, right? That you absolutely know is him, or it's the one. But and you know, is, an interrogation is going to be filled with anxiety. But I could see the police trick. I could see the simple police but trick. It's not of, a trick. It was six no, years Lydia, later. I know it wasn't. But I could hold up a picture and say, Lydia, is this you? And you could say, I don't know. Is it me? Yes, it is me. And it could not be the bridge guy photo. It could be a photo of someone True. took it. Right. right. So I think what he was saying, what Richard Allen saying is, I don't know what photo that is, but if it's a photo the girls took, it wasn't me. Just because think, I'm innocent. Correct. Well, I Even think that's though exactly what he, was he saying. had seen this picture on the internet for six years of himself. Well, we don't know which. the girls. We don't know which of the pictures. Now that's the okay. So I hadn't thought about that. That's a good thing. We don't theory. know which picture. That's right. Because if I were the cops, I would show him the picture that looks least like the picture that's been published and say, is this you? Hmm. And I think it was very telling probably to the investigators. As soon as he said, if that's a picture, that yeah, the what the are, heck? yeah, that that's not me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That is very <laughs> telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just going to say that his story should have been, I guess. I mean, it's always should have been, Hey, I was depressed. I had a few beers. I was just in my own head. I don't remember anything that should have been like a better story. Yeah. That would have also, been a better story. Another piece that it, it begs the question, which we don't really have the answer to. And maybe the sentencing report will give us a better idea is if Richard Allen thought that he could have been seen somewhere else wearing that outfit, uh -huh. where exactly, what is that outfit for? Right. It's got a mask in it. It's got, uh, it's too warm for the day. So if, you could think for a moment that you were seen somewhere else in this outfit. When was this? And what were you doing at that time? Because what I, if my suspicion and not speaking to Alan is that most first time um, sexually motivated uh, uh, 
people who sexual who are sexually motivated to assault or kill um have fantasized about it for oh, yeah. years and years yeah. and years some kind of violence that's mm -hmm. sexually motivated and i mean is it possible that this is the first time he had ever tried to prey on somebody and he happened to trip across two girls that perfectly fit whatever it was he was looking for when the opportunity was just right because they were stuck on a bridge absolutely but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other times where he's had it in the back of his mind right. and he's gone to other parks and done similar things or other things like that. And, and, and so there are a lot of clues in the trial that point to, because I know one of the arguments that people on the defense uh, who support the defense or support his innocence is a better way to put it, make is that it, do you mean to tell me that a man in his 40s who's never X, Y, or Z, uh, this was his first time offense? Well, not every precursor to a really bad crime is a crime, or not every precursor is caught. Right. So and 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 we don't know. And I that's a question that frustrates me online. I'm not gonna lie, because I'm like is there some formula that I don't know about where you have to do this and then you have to do this and then you have to do this before you murder two children in broad daylight? I don't think there is. Uh, there, you know, I, think, I guess that would be a question for Julia, but usually they do kind of like ratchet it up. And like well, there's calm escalation. And then, yeah, there's and escalation. There's, mm -hmm. there's but so maybe, one. and maybe for all we know, He's the guy in the black ski mask staring into windows in young America. Who knows? We don't know what this guy was doing. Well, I think the important thing to remember is there tends to be escalation. And when there is no escalation, when someone goes from zero to 60, it's usually a very emotional thing, right? But escalation doesn't mean a series of murders. Of course what it not. Means is escalating behavior in right. the direction of the fantasy whatever the fantasy is and Which, often often these types of people who end up killing killing is a sideshow to whatever they're doing right. we focus on the murder because that's the most heinous thing but sometimes the fantasy is something that comes well before the murder but you have to kill the people to get there or it's uh with necrophiles i mean if they can find a way to have sex with their bodies that they didn't kill they may very well do that but but i think there or is a they're just looking at little kids online which he may have been doing for correct. years we don't well, but, know but but, but there's but, been no report that i know of that but i think I, I i think stay away from the examples because i think the problem is we're trying to like tag these different things to it but we're talking about an internal fantasy that a person has in their right. mind at all. It may have nothing to do with pornography. It may have, it may be a sticks fantasy. Who knows? But whatever the fantasy is, right. it escalates over time right. and then ultimately is going to happen. And the one exception that tends to happen is just behaviorally, the one exception are things out of anger. And that's why I thought for a moment to address this issue of people having this misconception, I thought for a moment the prosecution was going to come in and say that they probably had an interaction at the front of the bridge where he said something to them and he exploded based on the response, based on what Abby said on the bridge, because I knew a lot of people would have a hard time wrapping their head around the idea that that guy who is your neighbor, mm -hmm. the guy down the hall, yeah, guy. or the guy a couple doors down could be seem perfectly fine and maybe perfectly fine otherwise, but having these very dark sexual uh, sexual fantasies that eventually they may act on. But he's always the CVS guy. This is why we make up these bizarre stories because it's always the CVS guy. It's always the neighbor. It's all these people are around us all the time, and it's always going to be him, but there's comfort in, in turning them into monsters like you do in fairy tales, you know, exaggerate all of these qualities. But the fact of the matter is this guy was just the guy at CVS. Israel Keys, same thing. Israel Keys, he's just yeah. your contractor. I mean, it, and you listen to people talk about him who actually know him and exactly what you said, Lydia, he's just the contractor or he, yeah. you know, the, the women who are around him said, man, I wish I had a dad. Mm -hmm. 
for my kids like that. Right. In, in all the 97 seasons of true crime bullshit that I've listened to, <laughs> in all of them, I have heard one person who knew Israel Keys who was like, yeah, man, there was something wrong with that. Dude. Right. Right. I mean, the same thing. With, I mean, Ted Bundy was a charmer, too. Yes. So, right. I mean, yep. And Bruce MacArthur. Bruce MacArthur was this successful landscaper that everyone loved to be around. And, you know, he's a serial killer in Toronto. And, I mean, this stuff happens. And it's just, it's frustrating to say, well, it can't be the CVS guy. It was the CVS guy. It don't was get me wrong. Guy. There are people like Dennis Rader where everybody's like, yeah, that makes sense. Creeper. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But, but that's not. That's not everyone. well, and honestly, the the murder sheet coverage of his former co-workers, they said he was creepy. They said he glared at women, which I found really interesting. So I went back and I listened to some of those episodes about these these the staring thing that everyone, literally everyone who attended the trial the observed. Room. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying this also took place with his co-workers at Walmart or you know, CVS these other people that had worked with him before said he would stare in a way that made them uncomfortable. And then Susan Hendricks, Tom Webster, all, you know, Kevin and Anya, all of these people were, who were at the you trial. Have on a, I mean, they everyone, all even, have people, a who story. Of, even yeah. people who are supportive of him. Even people who are supportive of him. Yeah, I'm have a story sure. of him turning around and locking eyes with them in the courtroom. Do you know and, if that what's happening in the presence of the jury? Yes, it was happening in the presence of the jury. So if you watch, Tom Webster had a little panel, like a, a mock jury panel yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of people. He didn't know what they were going to say. A bunch of people who had attended the trial and every single one of them had a story like that. And it all took place in the presence of the jury. And Kristen said she noticed one of the jurors looking at one of these interactions that yeah. Alan was having. He would actually swivel his chair around and stare down people. They theorize, I mean, this isn't known, but they theorized that he had watched a lot of these live streamers and people over the years and he knew who they were. And, you know, they felt like they were looking directly at that. He was looking directly at them because he had seen them cover this case over the years. And so she said it was it made the hair on the back of her wow. neck stand up. And and Anya had said the same thing, that it's a very chilling feeling. So and his his co-workers had said that. So he wasn't not a creepy guy before this. He was not. I don't think he was Mr. Green Jeans you know, well, according think, to his co-workers. I, yeah, I think he was unsettling. Enough to, not so much that you were like diving around corners because he was here, but enough to be like, this be is like, really yeah. weird. Well, and to your point about co-workers, it was almost like the closer they were to, and the longer they worked with him, the weirder it felt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, like, I mean, I know it's an option that, that one guy that like didn't attend his own trial. Sometimes you think with these side things that maybe it'd be better if a lot of them didn't go to their own trial and, yeah, like, and get caught like, doing these bad things. Cause I'm not going to lie. Koberger freaks me out in his trial. Like the way he looks at the attorneys and looks at different people in the court. And he's another guy that, that women said the same thing. Like he would look at them in a bar and they would be look extremely right freaked out. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually where Kristen's actual words. She said in that courtroom, she said, I felt like he was looking right through me. Yeah. And that is something people said about Coburg. And I don't like it even on camera and even from far away with him in the courtroom. So I don't think these are just like fluffy little bunny people. And then you wake up one day and they, they murder yeah. people. I don't believe that personally. And the stories from these people back that up. There's something there. And there there were troubles with him and Kathy. He said in one of his confessions, he's like, here's another thing I've screwed up for you. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And there were, you know, a couple moments the police, you know, came to that house for that domestic mm -hmm. and didn't arrest him. Um, but I think the interesting thing about him, him that's a little different than Brian Koberger out in Idaho is, you know, Richard Allen, well, Brian Koberger clearly is not uncomfortable 
with being on trial for a quadruple murder. Man, right. you know, he's not dancing in the streets, but he certainly looks like he's about to give his PhD presentation. And That's he's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Richard Allen clearly was uncomfortable at different moments, looked down at different moments, mm -hmm. you know, just demonstrated discomfort in so many ways. And that sort of led me to think that either the defense didn't coach him or more likely he's not coachable. He's not coachable. So, so what we I got agree. was a real, the real Richard Allen, um, maybe the real yeah. Richard Allen under stress um, in the courtroom. And I, I, I wondered what role that might, it'll be curious to see what, what, what the jurors observed if they ever talk about it, which, you know, I, I know the beauty I here, <laughs> yeah, well, the beauty here is I don't think they have to, because no. in my experience reporting, when you usually get jurors to talk, um, one of two things has happened. Something really weird in the juror room has happened, or the more likely reason is there's public criticism of the jury. They made their ruling too quickly. They didn't spend enough time looking at the evidence, X, Y, or Z. And um, I don't, I, I, you know, 18 hours over... What was it? Four days? Five four days? days? Four days. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't see any reason why they need to explain themselves. No, and and I really, I mean, for their sake, because I know how this case is like bath salts to weirdos on the internet. I kind of, I kind of hope they don't. And I sort of feel like there's not a mystery to be uncovered here. This was such an obvious going to be guilty case. To me, I don't, there's no mystery I need to understand that the, you know, comes from the jury room. I want to hear from you say the that. families. Because you say obvious going to be guilty case. It was not an obvious going to be guilty case for me, but it was obvious he was guilty. And that's an interesting huh. aspect of this for me is I suspect when we come back 10 years from now or whatever, um, I suspect this case, just like Adnan Saeed's um, conviction of the murder of Heyman Lee, is going to have tons of people who support Richard Allen in spite of the evidence, in spite of what the jury ruled, in spite of whatever's going to come out in the sentencing report. And I, I do think the prosecution had to operate against those headwinds. And I just give them credit for not mm -hmm. falling into the trap of starting the game on the defense. Yeah, they, I agree. They, they started the game on offense. Um, they demonstrated no vitriol to the nope. defense attorneys, even totally though professional. every reason in the world. They, you know, I I cannot, I do not remember a thing that they said that was uh, uh, pejorative about Richard Allen beyond the fact that he committed these murders. Nope. No, it was it was flawless. They but didn't the, fall for it. The, the difference between you and me on that guilt score is when I know they're guilty, I think they're going to be found guilty 100% of the time. That's what I always tell Brett. I'm wow. always like, I always think the, the jury is going to vote like me. I do. I really believe that. I never worried about it. I never, you know, except for early in the case when we really didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't any prosecution evidence that was kept quiet for so long. But once we got that evidence, zero, I had zero doubt. You know, it was well, just. But we're, we live in a totally noise. different time. Like, that's the thing. We live in a CSI world. We live in a, a YouTube. We live in an anti-police. I mean, I thought Karen, Karen Reed's case was much easier than this one. And uh, that was that one was hung. But that's hopefully because of just the strategy. Well, uh, they they did such a bad job. At least you know you can say what you want to about Fran Gall and and you know people have, but this was locked down so tightly in a sequestered jury. I don't even know if she knows about Karen Reed, but she obviously knew that it was going to be risky to have those jurors exposed to literally anything. She was taking cameras on day one. So she knew that that was a problem, and and that did not happen in Karen Reed. That was a wide well, also, open circus. Yes, evidence that had very little basis in fact was also yes. allowed in in the Karen yep. Reed trial. And to your point, Mike, 
the prosecution both picked a strategy that was instantly yeah. on the defensive, but I'll also throw in with the Karen Reed prosecutors, which will hopefully be resolved with the new prosecutor, is their execution of the storytelling was yeah. terrible. Now, don't get me wrong. These are both complex cases yep. in the sense that, I mean, they're really simple in one way, but in another way, they're complex because the narrative on both of them is not easy to follow, right? Like why it's so obvious Richard Allen is guilty cannot be summed up in two sentences while we are cooking spaghetti. Same thing, uh, although Karen Reed's a little No, bit. Karen Reed's is easy. She was I agree. Drunk, she got pissed at him. She, she I agree. Inverse, didn't think she'd hit no, him. No, no, but that, that's a and theory. That's no, no, that's a theory of what happened. But I'm talking about why it's so obvious that she's guilty. Can't be really quickly summed up, right? So you need to be a good storyteller. You need to be able to tell a simple story. And in the Karen Reed case, I mean, if you remember the opening to that, like it was oh, like, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's all over the place. It was oh, all he boarded. Boarded. Yeah. yeah. Because he did, and like his wasn't like the story. Like I, I would have, I would have led. I think I would have led with the 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 five minute after she left. Call says I fucking hate you. I right. would have led with that call. Right. Like, yeah. Right. Like, like right. here's what she was said five minutes after she left his body on the on the lawn. And here's and the like, tail light pieces in his shirt. And yeah. I mean, but I think he was fighting demons we had not seen prior to trial. So he's he's fighting this crazy conspiracy narrative. And we were seeing the end of his fight and him trying to beat all that back. And he had a judge that did not that bent over backwards to let the conspiracy win in the courtroom, in my opinion. And it was just a very different scenario. And then we had a jury that was being filmed by the person who had committed a felony witness intimidation in the courtroom, filming and yeah. doxing the jurors. So Gall, none of that was going to happen on her. Well, I also think community too, right? You're, you're, I, I don't know about, it's Fort Wayne that they came from, right? I don't know yes, what the Fort relationship Wayne. with law enforcement or government is like in Fort Wayne. But I do think in Canton, Massachusetts, you're dealing with different kinds of issues in that area around the relationship in the Boston metropolitan area with law enforcement in general. I don't think they're moving. I don't think they're walking in with as much trust as some local law enforcement. But it makes no sense to attempt to defend against the man conspiracy theory story when you have a very simple narrative to tell and that's what nick mcclellan the prosecutor and delphi did he just told a very simple story simple. because and, it I, was, and i think the problem are about the defense i think the the issue is the defense didn't complicate it enough i guess i mean i think they wanted to complicate it with odinism as and but they didn't complicate they didn't i don't from what i'm hearing is they didn't complicate it enough i mean they didn't do this wild crazy thing they did in Karen Reed and they made it more complicated by saying, well, maybe 12 people at the party all got in a fight and pushed them down the stairs and they're all covering for each other. Like, and, and that's a really, there was things they could have tried them. They didn't. Huh. I mean, I think he, I mean, he needed to make the, the, the steps and the, and the cover up more complicated than it was. And that was what I've always I've been saying is that like you, you'd say that, I mean, why did he cover him with some branches? And why did he spend a lot of time covering but not covering? And I mean, like, why did he take this time to undress and dress and say, like, did they really? I'm not saying it would have won, but it was, I mean, they're half dressed. She, They're different clothing. So, I mean, there was I would have tried to make the, co the, the, the crime scene more complex, and they did not do that with any experience. Yeah, there were there were there were some missed opportunities, and I think you're hitting on one of them, and it's a common one. Like, how did all this happen in a short amount of time? Now, we're only estimating when the murders actually happened based on when the phone stopped moving, but the phone was found on the ground outside of them, so the phone may have stopped moving before they were really murdered. We don't really know, but but 
it, you know, that is one pressure point that you could have used that really wasn't used. It's a short timeline. Why did some of the girls' clothes end up in the water downstream? That is definitely something that you could have used. How hard it would have been to hike out of that area to the cemetery, that is completely another thing that they could have used. Now, I understand they were denied things like the sketches, which would have given them, you know, the potential for another uh, another another suspect on the trails. But there are lots of things you could have complicated. There are some other things that they didn't do. And, and so, you know, part of me says, were they so focused on their Odinus theory? But also they did a couple different <clears throat> things that were surprising that they didn't do that I think may have been intentional. They didn't do the part where you told the story of Richard Allen as a great father, as a great nice. husband, as a, was that? a successful coworker. No. Uh, you didn't do the story about how he's gentle with puppies and how, you know, he's mm -hmm. a good Samaritan. So like, where is that? What, where's that story? And did you where just miss that? it? Did you just miss it? Or did you not want to open that door? That and, and the other thing that they always talk about is an innocent person. I guess where this is where maybe where we disagree. An innocent person usually wants to tell their story. And did Richard Allen ever want to like, did he ever complain about not getting up on the stand? Or why didn't none of his followers, like, why didn't you get up there? At least 60 times, Mike. Well, right. He got his side of the story out. But he couldn't, like, I mean, but it, he didn't get up there and say, well, I, they beat the shit out of me. I was Right. They used the hood. They, and that, they, they used mean, hoses on me. He, I mean, he didn't try and tell a story. It's very, very, very telling. To not tell your story, though. And you can see it in the Alec Murdoch trial right now. He has waived so many of his rights related to appeal, not truly waived, but he, he, so many of his avenues are cut off by his own words, by things that he said mm -hmm. while he was on the stand and the fact yeah. that he he took the stand. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, you're turning it into a character issue there. All it takes is as you're telling, you've got to humanize the person at that point. Right. And as you're telling your story, you are opening the door for all sorts of character stuff. I don't even think, I don't even remember other bad acts, facts that were. No, there were no other bad acts. There, there were none that were submitted. Nope. I, well, I thought there was a point about like, the, didn't, did Richard get in any trouble? Did he ever have any domestic violence and against yes there and that would have been brought in no, the, that would, would have been brought in if he got on the stand they didn't even try it was yeah. never even in a filing nick didn't need it there he was did a not need it. well he knew it would not come in unless yeah. unless somehow but it richard also, had to bring well, it in I, and i don't know how much there there is there because it was a domestic disturbance call that led to a mental health evaluation so it could have been like he was yelling at his wife and he was acting well, crazy kind of it thing. Was it was in close proximity to, to the murders. It was yeah. like a, a mental breakdown yeah. in my opinion, but he didn't, he didn't need it, but I, it is so interesting because the back to back to back trials that we've had this summer that we've all kind of watched together. There were character witnesses for Sarah Boone. Sarah Boone had people is she and, the and one she herself the boyfriend in the suitcase? Yes. And I she herself, that. they we talked about how great a human being, insert sarcasm here, Sarah Boone was for a good portion of that trial. Nick Mew, <laughs> Ashley Benefield, all of these people who have been on trial this summer, even the Crumblies had someone who was willing to say. Oh my gosh, you know, their um, Dewey Decimal system filing was the best ever or yeah. whatever, some random fact. Well, but and there were, there were you know what the only people that stood up for Richard Allen at this trial said, Did he molest you? No. Do you love him? Yes. Would you lie for him? No. End of testimony. That is all you got from the people that knew him the best. And that's a telling thing, too because it suggests that the defense is trying to, and you know, the way, the way it works, right? You guys know this, 
But the way it works is, you know, on cross-examination, you can only go uh, to the places where the direct examination yeah. goes. And when I heard how right. narrow, narrow. That, that direct examination of his family yeah. members by defense, I was like, there is a whole story behind the uh, behind this human that we are not getting right now. Mm -hmm. but we'll probably get in this sentencing report. I think we're going to get it. Yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, I guess, kind of move on or, and almost kind of wrap it up. But I guess our sentencing, as I brought up in the beginning, is I guess I is with the four counts, I don't know how it works. Somebody said he was eligible for like 133 years right. in prison. But I think, I, th I mean, when you get both felony murder and murder, they can kind of murder. Like you get one or the other, I think. It depends on what the statute's in the – in I think, Indiana. I think Brett said he'd have at least two consecutive, probably. Um, well, but normally 20, like people always, I think it's very interesting. Like when they say life, life is usually 25 years. So he could get, they read, I mean, I don't know what it is in Indiana. He could get like 50 years before I think he's Indiana's eligible. Indiana's going to give him a little more than 50. Well, they, but he'll be eligible for parole like at 50. Well, I don't Which, think, I mean, he's, I bet bad. he's getting life without parole. He'd be eligible for parole at 50. At 50, he, yeah. He's in his 40s he's now. Late, late 40s. Late 40s he get now. out at, uh, at 100. A, get out at a point where uh, it won't matter. I mean, he ain't it, getting and, out. And the, likely, the likelihood of him getting out ever. Um, I think he's getting life without parole. Yeah. That's so, what I think. So... I think what usually I think the way that I from the way that I understood it is that the, that it's not it's not a legal thing for sentencing, but customarily, if you have felony murder and murder on the same charge, mm -hmm. they become one. one. And it's not a requirement. But it um, is judge determined sentence. So via con Dios with Fran Gall. Well, so the, the other thing that my my understanding is that the sentencing report um the sentencing report's going to be done by staff in Fort Wayne because right. the Carroll County staff doesn't doesn't have it and you know looking at obviously they're going to be mitigating factors they're going to be um like factors what? Well, I mean, like what, any mental health condition is going to be a mitigating factor. Uh, uh, his father abandoning them as a child is going to be a mitigating factor. He They're was gonna be two, and he got adopted by another man when he was two. Yeah, but hang out with adopted kids. They're, they, no, I, I know. It doesn't I matter get when. Attachment disorders and all that, but there, I mean. There, there, there will be plenty of mitigating factors that can come in. Whether the judge gives them any weight compared right. to aggravating factors, seriously doubt it. But in everyone's life, you can find mitigating factors. I just don't think that they're going to, at least with what we know right now, um, you know, in one of his confessions, he said he was sexually abused. That will probably, if it's true, that will probably come in. Again, I don't think they'll outweigh any of the aggravating factors, including the fact that you kidnapped uh kids that you i mean an assortment of different things whatever else he's done in his life what but do you I, think one that would be successful is a mitigating factor that in this particular case i think in this particular case of a double homicide of two girls i don't think there is a mitigating factor that falls below what would have led to you having a successful insanity plea I think only someone who truly was insane is going to have enough mitigating factors to shave points off uh, this yeah, sentence. And they didn't with, even try that. With the aggra aggravating factors. But one really interesting thing for me was that the defense agreed to one day for the sentencing, um, even though the possibility of more was on the table. And it just brings me back to like, what do you not want to talk about? What is it about this guy you do not want to talk about that All we don't it. know about yet? Yeah. But I guess I'm curious because no, normally the process, like, I'd have to see. So normally the process, as I understand it, is that there's, like, three or four sides that, like, put things together. So the defense is going to put their worksheet together yep. and say, well, here are the factors. He should get 25 years. The probation office put, puts together their sheet. And then the mm -hmm. prosecution puts together their sheet. And then, like, on that day, the we'll have probably the normal that the the family members come and say that 
Libby was the Abigail and Libby were like here are the stars of our lives and we'll hear that story and then the judge makes the decision at the end of, or either the next or usually th that day so we'll probably find out on the 20th how long he sends for well so in in Indiana I, I was looking at this the aggravating factors are interesting prior criminal record I'm not aware of one significant harm caused they're dead they may have been sexually assaulted uh, it was a horrific death. The victim's age, are they under 12 or over 65? So that's another aggregate. Ag that is another aggregating, aggra uh, aggravated <laughs> factor that he just barely misses out on. Um, right. Violation of protective orders, uh, crimes committed in the presence of minors. So that one is going to be a, it's going to be an aggregating factor. So mitigating factors were lack of significant harm, victim's role in the offense, right? Like I punch you in the face and you push right. me off the bridge. Likelihood of positive response to probation. You can write that one off. Offender's attitude and character. And it's that character part that I think is going to be really interesting. And that attitude part is going to be very interesting. Um, and then restitution efforts. So if Richard Allen had... Uh, confessed like he said he wanted to and he had said the reason why I'm confessing is I do not want to um, you know I don't have a million dollars but what I can give the victim's family is answers and a way to not go through the pain of a trial I think that would have mitigated for him I he think tried. Yeah. I mean, he can always like he can do that on sentencing day whether the judge will buy it. I mean, that's the what I'm problem. telling you, Mike, is that once you've wasted the court's time and money, the judge doesn't mm. care anymore whether you're saving them anything. Like that, it, it, restitution is not going to be an apology for it or an allocution, right? right. It's right. really going to be like saving everybody from this drama and the anxiety. So I guess what I'm saying is he's got very few mitigating factors under Indiana code. Perhaps he can slow, slow the uh, slide, the mental illness into the attitude and character one, but it's going to be, it's going to be really, really tough. I mean, he's obviously going to get earned time for however long he's been in. Yeah. I mean, he's hope, I mean, all I can really hope for is maybe like he'll be eligible for parole in 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. He's going to at least get 15 apiece. You know he's what he could do parole. if he really wanted to do something for the families? He could say he's not going to appeal and let them rest. Yeah. I, it's worth a shot. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, at this point, anything unless, but again, yeah. you know, Kathy Allen, when she walked out of court today, mm -hmm. and she was walking out with our friend Bob Mata. <laughs> um, she, did you hear what she said? Yeah, that it's yeah, not over. Did. That it's not over at all. But but here's what I said, and I I said this on Twitter. She is surrounded by manipulative, grifting con men who have given her false, false hope, hope this entire yeah. time, and she lived with a con man who manipulated her, and she is not out of that cycle of being manipulated by these terrible men all of whom we have mentioned tonight. And I'm not going to hold that against her because she is, I feel like she is getting the worst advice you could possibly get from a bunch of people who are in it for something other than Kathy Allen's best interests. Yeah. So I'm not holding against her. What I'm saying is I suspect we're going to see the opposite attitude of not appealing. But maybe Richard uh, Allen but, finally wants someone to listen to him. But and he can always go on date. Like, it. if he wants to, he can go on Dateline or or go to talk to somebody and get and tell his story and confess his sins. Yeah. Maybe he'll I do mean, that. And maybe he'll go on Netflix. Yeah. And, In my mind, that would be mitigating if he's like, hey, I did it. I've been really trying happened. to tell y'all I did it for two years and no one will listen to me and I'm not going to appeal. Yeah, I'm going to let so, the families rest. And so I think, by the way, so back to the point that you were making about sentencing and the 
three years, Mike. I think it's, I think it's forty-five to sixty-five years for murder. So if they were to not collapse them, you'd be talking about ninety. To- 90 to 200 and something. Good. So, <clears throat> I suspect the 130 is the combination of the two murder charges. Just- I, I don't know if that's true. That was just what I, the rumor. And as they said, you can find anything on the internet. So yeah. I don't I, I think it will collapse. I mean, I think it will collapse. They'll get it down to either murder or, or felony murder. I mean, so it's, it's the two murders. And then what if it's 45 years per each one? And then, I mean, well, 45 you can do them. 45 to 65. Yeah, let's go with Depending on the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. 45 is the base. I'm I'm for 65. And 45 no, is the guy who murders somebody. It's first degree murder. And we got into a fight on the bridge and I accidentally pushed you off the bridge. And then mm-hmm. I tried to save you as you were falling off and blah, blah, blah. Right. That, that, and I'm also a deacon and blah, yeah, blah, blah. Right, but that's right, 45. Right, right. I mean, but. I guess we're, just, we're arguing some pins on. Or I mean, I understand things, what you're saying. You're saying in most places it's 25 to life is life. Yeah, that Maryland. I mean, Maryland, for example, 20 for like 25 years is where they become eligible for parole, and now it's even less. So it's 25. It's 20 to th- 20 to 30 or 20 to 40 in, in Indiana for a level one felony, right? So top felony, except for murder. Murder is 45 to 65. So life. To your point, in Indiana, would be forty-five. Longer. So I mean, together that's nine. I mean, it's at least ninety. Yep. Yep. Unless, unless she stacks it. Let's go for one thirty. Right. Just right. I don't see. Happen. I don't see goal stacking. She's gonna. She's, she's gonna not make gonna it. stack it. If she, we're gonna be because the option of not doing it, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just really like stepping away from everything the defense has done and all the strangeness about the case. It's just a heinous crime. It's heinous. It's just absolute heinous crime. And even Richard Allen uh, killed me to hear this, but even he said it. Like when he was talking to his therapist, Monica Walla, which like that, that was the conversation I saw with the most contrition. He said that he got scared. His plan was to sexually assault them. He got scared. And when he got scared, what led to their deaths was basically his fear of being caught. And he he said something along the lines of, um, you know, I killed them to save me. And that was mm-hmm. selfish. Right. And 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 part of me makes it's it's just sad. But 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 he's so dead right. It, the wow. crime the crime was not necessary. The crime also there were ample opportunities for it to not actually happen. He had to make at least three or four choices along the way that mm-hmm. led to them dying in commission of the act, and I just don't see that leading to a light sentence without some miraculous thing and i don't i fear that his attorneys who have picked boneheaded strategies before i suspect they will pick a boneheaded strategy for sentencing as well of course they well, will I it's mean, inevitable it, there's not much they can do i mean i don't think there is too much they can do even on their sentencing but you know what one. else but there's a lot you can do wrong a lot you can do wrong and if they anybody can, if anybody's going to do it wrong it's going to be this crowd well they're going to ask but, like the felony murders if i was i would compare the the felony murder uh, and compare it to a normal murder and i would hammer whichever is less but That's, you know what is also true jason about that extremely sad statement is doug carter was right about 100% of everything he said about this perpetrator. He said, it's all about power to you. He said, I think you have a little bit of conscience left. And he was right. He was right about that. The 63 confessions speak to that. This person wanted to tell people what he had done and go as far as to apologize to these girls' families. Everything Doug Carter said was true everything and anybody who wants to go to war on that 
on the internet is on a fool's errand because he was right about this perpetrator. Well, but that, I guess they, uh, and then let's finish it off with this. I guess the, the thing they could do if they really wanted to fight, they, if they really want to fight it is they'll go after the appeals. That's, that's where this. That's where they'll, I, hope, they'll I, really I don't know what appeal you. Uh, uh, they could. Yeah. Well, I guess Good we luck. didn't really talk about it, but um, the the sketches. I mean, they could do it on the sketches. They could do it on the uh, third party that they weren't allowed. I don't yeah, know. I, mean, like, I could do it on anything. I could do it on my theory of the aliens. But I, I, I mean, what the sketches are an investigative tool. They're not evidence. So you bring them well, in on appeal for evidence. I mean, it's not. It's not settled in Indiana, but certainly around most of the country, unless the sketch is used to make the arrest. Right. Which it wasn't. It wasn't. Case. It's an investigative tool. Um, you know, uh, an example of where a sketch became evidence was Timothy McVeigh. Yep. That's an example of where a sketch became hard evidence in the, in the case. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the other arguments have been about uh, the funding for defense experts. There's no no evidence that they've spent all the money that they were given. There's no evidence that they spent the money that they raised. There's no evidence that they asked the uh, investigators to do ballistic tests that that they didn't do. I ineffective assistance counsel, certainly not, right? You fought to keep your attorney. Yeah, I mean um, that's going to kill a big chunk of ineffective assistance of counsel. Yep. And frankly, yeah, at trial, I don't think they were that bad. <clears throat> I didn't see any drinking at the, the defense table. So when I remember looked at it. when we lost Andy Baldwin? Remember when Andy Baldwin just like could not be found? No. And they had to stop? I don't. Yeah. He just like wandered off and nobody knew where, where he was. And Judge Gall came in and was like. Um, we're missing someone and they had to stop for 30 minutes, go find Andy and then come back. That's hilarious. Um, but I think, I, I don't think they're great avenues for appeal. Like, I think you can walk away from this trial pretty confident, particularly because, and, and, and this is bad defense work because these are also missed opportunities. I think most attorneys would have gotten cake and client in. Most attorneys oh, sure. would have gotten oh yeah <clears throat> some of the other things in. I yeah. think no brainer between some of their pretrial mistakes in terms of their focus and the way that Judge Gold has handled the evidence. I think you've got arguments, but they're all weak. Like I, I, yeah, well, I go to bed tonight convinced that this is done. Me too. I don't think I don't I. Nothing about the way this trial no. was handled. Now, you never know what an appeals court's going to find, or you find some novel argument. But you know, like you take some of these cases where where attorneys truly have been terrible or have been high while they're, while they're <laughs> <laughs> off the hours. You take some of these like cases, yeah. like you know, I hate to bring in a Bob Mata case in, but. Man's got a point. Like when they're drugging your client without your permission, and he's trying to help you yeah. with defense. If that is not appealable, I don't see anything in the Richard Allen version of the appeal. world that's going to be um, successful. And no, and that. Alice, Alice said that today. She's okay. like, "You don't understand how solid this is." No, now. I think it. It's I think so it really solid. is. And I think the other thing that's separate right and this comes to judges or humans too i suspect the appellate courts are done with this case oh they're done yeah yeah, yeah. I, agree. Okay. I have no worries so no worries okay anyway, i think yep i think i need to family. finish up so thank you for meeting us on quick notice um i'm can gonna we, go can ahead we give and... one shout out to kathy shank before That's we go it. thank you and kathy that. shank and also to Becky Patty and Anna Williams yeah. and the rest of the family, because as much as this is for us a story or true crime, um, it really is their lives. It's their real life. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine mm -mm. if it were my real life happening. And I cannot mm -hmm. imagine what it would be like to hear everyone talking about my loved one. Yeah. Like this. So um, I just, 
one of the things that just struck me about Becky Patty when I saw her at Crime Con in 2023, and then when I heard about her organizing food for the people who were staying overnight, yeah. is that that woman has operated in this case, and so is Anna, with and an Kelsey. enormous, yeah, and Kelsey, with an enormous amount of grace for yeah. people who have not always um, showed them that same yeah. Thing. So it's anyway. time for them to be able to tell their story. Yeah. Soon. Soon. Gag order continues though. Yeah. Soon though. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Hang on one second. Okay. <laughs> 